mic sound okay? Wow, pretty sensitive. I'll try not to, to yell, but can live stream everything good? Excellent. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, really excited to talk today about open cost. Um, brand new open source project for cloud native uh, cost monitoring. Um, my goal today is to first introduce the project, um, second, give a live action demo in a Kubernetes environment, uh, and then third, talk about some of the lessons uh, we learned and kind of methodology applied uh, to the Open Cost project. Uh, so first, a bit about me, um, co-founder and CEO of KubeCost. Um, we build cost management solutions specifically tailored for Kubernetes and containers. Um, engineer by training, uh, former Google product manager where I was working on infrastructure monitoring there. Um, if we start by just thinking about um, you know, the broader Kubernetes ecosystem, it is mind-blowing to me that now five plus million developers are now engaging with the Kubernetes platform. Um, I would feel like every day I'm hearing of new and interesting deployments and, and applications of Kubernetes. Um, just this week, I've heard of um, Kubernetes in space, Kubernetes in automotive, and a bunch of other like interesting applications. Um, it just increasingly is feeling a lot like the Linux um, like project itself, and that it's being like modified and molded for a bunch of different applications. Um, and we think this is for very real reasons, right? So tons of flexibility, control, portability, scalability, et cetera. So that is super positive. On the other side, it is um, really kind of changing a lot of the dynamics around cost monitoring and, and cost management. Um, and it can be challenging um, when you're new to Kubernetes to operate it efficiently. And this is really for kind of two, two reasons. Um, first is, is really technical, right? So you have this new layer of abstraction that is the scheduler. Um, it is now kind of harder to intuit why and where applications are, are placed. Um, secondly is uh, applications and uh, like uh, items in your Kubernetes cluster tend to be more dynamic. So pods and jobs coming up and down, nodes coming up and down, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, lastly, and probably mostly important, is that there's way more likely to be shared resources, right? So um, the old world of kind of, um, doing or, or pre-Kubernetes costs, you know, monitoring cost management was you allocate a VM, you tag it for like a team or an application, et cetera, um, the, and, and you kind of like uh, charge that back or allocate it to that you know, particular entity. Um, that kind of largely breaks down in Kubernetes uh, because again, all resources are, resources are generally shared uh, and it is really hard um, or you need to go deeper to like think about allocating those, those fairly. Uh, and then secondly is generally we see behavioral or organizational changes. Um, again, these are super positive. Teams tend to be shipping more rapidly in a more decentralized way. Um, but from a cost and like optimization standpoint, it can make it more difficult um, to kind of manage or govern or, or again, even understand why costs kind of radically change. And so uh, the, the sum of these complexities results in most teams not able, being able to answer really basic questions about costs in their infrastructure. Um, in fact, really interesting study by CNCF last year where approximately 70% of companies do not have accurate uh, visibility into their you know, cost um, around their containers and, and Kubernetes uh, footprint. So, it is for that reason that we are super proud to introduce uh, the brand new open cost uh, effort. Um, so it is a new uh, open source uh, project for cost monitoring and cost allocation in Kubernetes environments. It is vendor agnostic. It is Apache 2.0 licensed. It is uh, you know, now all of uh, two weeks uh, new. Um, and the project itself has two pieces here. Uh, so first, a community-built spec, uh, which is brand new, that talks about kind of the 
the how and the why around uh, doing accurate you know, Kubernetes cost monitoring. And then the um, KubeCoss team has contributed our core cost allocation, uh, which is a Golang implementation of that spec uh, for AWS, Azure, GCP, and on-prem clusters. Um, so that meets all the requirements um, of the spec as of today. And if we talk a little bit about kind of the backstory and, and how we got here, um, like really proud to you know, be one part of this amazing group of contributors that built the, the spec and kind of the design of the open cost project. Um, really amazing to see this mix of cloud providers and Kubernetes experts and end users who have been running Kubernetes at massive scale uh, for, you know, for years now. And it was also a really interesting mix of um, a lot of engineering backgrounds like ourselves, uh, but also like finance or FinOps groups um, from some of these different companies. Um, and what I think was most interesting about this is like this group largely came together organically. And we really saw it as a function of the fact that there's just tons of ambiguity still in this uh, space where you know, even cloud providers had uh, different end users asking questions about how to think about cost. A couple of these companies actually implemented their own cost monitoring and arrived at um, largely you know, different answers on what a namespace or you know, pod, et cetera, cost. Um, so it was really cool to see them come together uh, and start to think about, again, kind of a common language here when we think about costs in, in cloud native or, or Kubernetes environments. Uh, one thing that I am super proud to announce uh, just happened last week. Um, this group came together with the intention of finding a like neutral home uh, for the project, uh, and the project was just accepted to the CNCF, uh, and it's going through CNCF onboarding, um, you know, literally as we speak. Uh, so really proud to announce the the completion of that onboarding. Hopefully here soon. Expected within kind of the next month. Um, all right, so let's get into some of the, um, the core tenets or like foundational principles for, uh, for open costs. And I think it's all anchored around the fact that this was built for enabling action, right? Uh, enabling engineering teams or even FinOps teams to get in there and actually manage or optimize infrastructure uh, efficiently. Um, so the first kind of core tenet to doing this was actually having cost visibility, the cost visibility in real time. Um, again, this is a major departure from kind of uh, pre-Kubernetes where you generally would like wait on a cloud provider bill, it may be six, it may be 24 hours later. Um, we can give you costs uh, by default uh, in open costs uh, one minute after say like a new pod or job, et cetera, has, uh, has been spun up in an environment. It can be configured to give you costs uh, you know, even faster than that. And so, you know, that is you know, really important in terms of like actually managing efficient infrastructure, um, you know, waiting to optimize infrastructure a day later or, you know, six or 12 hours later uh, is far less uh, impactful than if you can do it in real time. And you can also do a bunch of really cool things like now auto scale on cost uh, or uh, again, make either orchestration infrastructure or application level changes based on cost. Second core tenet was really having the ability to look at cost by truly any dimension. Um, this is really important because organizations like architect or organize their applications or microservices differently in Kubernetes, but also the ability to actually take action or have teams bought into these cost figures is truly a function of the ability to like understand how they're generated. And so when you say, um, you know, tell me the cost of a namespace, it is really common for engineering teams to say, well, why does it cost that? Having the ability to drill down into you know, services in that namespaces or labels in that namespaces or individual pods is really powerful. And then you know, thirdly, because uh, open cost was purpose built for Kubernetes, it has you know, native support for anything that's gonna be shared in that environment. Um, so this is you know, underlying shared, you know, nodes, disk, et cetera, but it's also if you have workloads in the environment that are shared by other tenants. So say you have a monitoring namespace or a logging namespace, um, open cost would support the ability to allocate those shared resources in, in different capacity. And I mentioned uh, you know, this pre-Kubernetes way of kind of using cloud tags, 
um, which from my perspective um, was always kind of um, reactive and, and kind of a manual exercise. Um, now with open costs, you just get kind of the natural organization of your Kubernetes workloads, um, whether that's again by, by namespace or by microservice or by controller. Um, and this generally fits really well into just natural development workflows. So there's no major retroactive coming back and reviewing tags like there was before. Um, I mentioned to you how it was, you know, it was really important to have support for the major three as well as on-prem you know, out of the box, uh, which we now do with the open cost implementation. And then I would say you know, the, the last piece of this, which is um, kind of why we open source this is Already the project has a bunch of deep integrations with things like you know, Prometheus and um, you know, Alert Manager and OpenTelemetry and um, you know, Cortex and other PromQL uh, you know, time series databases. Um, we just see a real opportunity to uh, enable a bunch of really cool integrations. Now that this is open source, one. Um, and two, like ultimately bring um, this data and these insights where you know, developers are, are spending their time. So already you can see this data on kubectl, um, you know, Grafana dashboards and, and other places that may feel really natural, you know, for your kind of day-to-day -day workflow. So with that, I was going to dive into a quick demo and just show you, you know, some of this in action. Um, so this is a little uh, demo environment that I have set up. Uh, where there's real uh, Kubernetes workloads running. Um, so first we're looking at cost by namespace. I talked about how we really like haven't seen a breakdown of cost that we um, don't support today. So um, you know any of these dimensions uh, from again all the way down to container or pod, all the way up to like the cluster level and in between, everything in between. Um, you can also do like multi aggregations, you know, with the, the open cost APIs. So from here, um, I can see that, you know, I see cost over time. I'm looking at it on a daily basis. If I look at, say, just cost today, I can see cost, which is allocated in this UI on an hourly basis. If I go down to the underlying APIs, I can see cost again, you know, in, in near real time or real time, depending on how you've configured open cost. And so from here, I can now um, see the cost of every single resource uh, that is consumed by uh, each namespace in this cluster. I can then kind of one click drill into any particular namespace. And here I see every single controller that's running in this environment. So all of the daemon sets, deployments, jobs, staple sets, et cetera, that's running. Again, this is really critical for understanding you know, why in the world this uh, namespace costs what it does. Uh, from here, here, I can actually just keep going um, down to the individual pod level and then further like look at truly each individual container that's running in this namespace and all the resources they're consuming um, and the cost of each resource. So again, this is super powerful from our experience working with thousands of teams running Kubernetes. Um, to ultimately getting to um, the confidence level or ability even to take action to actually uh, impact, say, the cost of this namespace. Um, so that's kind of one part of the, the demo, which is kind of, again, diving into the allocation of, of any cost in your environment. If we flip over to the other side, uh, it is thinking about the underlying assets or resources that are avail av available in your Kubernetes cluster. And here again, um, the open cost pod is just sitting in a Kubernetes cluster, introspecting anything that becomes available. You know, right away it starts emitting metrics uh, for that particular workload, uh, based on the fact that it's say in an EKS cluster or you know GKE cluster or on-prem cluster with um, kind of custom pricing sheets. So here we can see uh, this uh, cluster has four different nodes uh, that have been running over the last seven days. I can drill down to you you know, again, the individual node level and see uh, like resource level detail about uh, what's happening with this particular asset. So again, I think um, kind of highlights the two different parts of the open cost model. Um, one is, again, the individual assets and resources that are in existence or observable in your environment. 
And then two is the allocation of those to, to any you know, aggregation or any dimension of um, you know, Kubernetes workload that's, that's available. All right, cool. So that is a you know, quick uh, demo of the open cost data. Um, I'm now going to turn to kind of talking about um, some of the lessons and, and you know, methodology here. Um, I will say there is another talk uh, later this week on open cost, which is going really deep into applications and how this data can actually be um, applied to um, make really critical decisions in your environment, that sort of stuff. All right, so with all this complexity uh, in measuring costs, there's actually just two equations that you really need to solve um, to either implement the open cost spec or in our view do cost monitoring real effect, really effectively in these environments. Um, so this all starts with just thinking about the total cluster cost uh, for your Kubernetes environment. Again, we kind of saw that at play, but that's everything that's observable from compute to network to storage, et cetera. And then this can be broken down into uh, individual asset cost or direct cost, as well as overhead cost. Um, so you can think about these as from like a um, you know, finance perspective as like asset costs are kind of like um, cost of goods sold or like variable cost. Uh, whereas overhead costs are more fixed uh, on a, a per cluster level. And then asset costs can be further broken down here on the right uh, into kind of allocation-based costs and then usage-based costs. Uh, so allocation costs are those that are um, actually provisioned or reserved uh, based on capacity, um, and it's less relevant if you're actually using them because you're getting billed for them you know, one way or the other where again, usage costs are you know, just pay for, for what you use. And then when we think about like a, a practical um, set of examples for this, if you just look um, uh, like on, on this right chart, uh, in the left-hand side, some examples of like allocation-based costs are like you know, node with CPU, you know, RAM, GPU resources attached, um, disk, whether they're attached disk or persistent volumes, uh, load balancers, et cetera. And you know, the most common like usage-based costs in a Kubernetes environment would just be like network egress costs, right? If you're not networking uh, or not egressing cross costs across the, the network, then you're not actually being billed. And then the most common example of, of like overhead costs would just be like a cloud provider, say cluster management fee. Uh, but this could be also um, kind of like an internal DevOps team time that is allocated to an actual cluster. Um, when you think about, again, kind of show back or charge back for that, for that particular cluster. All right, and then the other, you know, really important question or equation to like answer, which is what is the cost of each container running in the environment? So we just talked about a cluster level, talking about the macro, you know, cost of everything running in your ecosystem. Um, this is then going all the way down to the bottom and looking at each individual container. And here, the open cost spec, and what we strongly recommend for like thinking about you know, Kubernetes cost monitoring is taking into the fact like uh, Kubernetes request as well as usage, right? So let's walk through a couple examples. Um, so if a pod is best efforts and does not have a Kubernetes request applied, meaning it doesn't have resources that have kind of been allocated for it by the scheduler, um, costs are based on just usage only. Um, so you, you know, pay for what you use, and if you don't use anything, you don't incur any costs. So this is great from like an efficiency standpoint in the sense that like there are no idle costs associated with this workload. But it comes at the trade-off of um, this uh, best effort pod is generally going to be the first to be CPU throttled. It's generally going to be the first to be like um, you know, ohm evicted if there is uh, a shortage of, of memory available. Um, so you can think about it as like, is actually really good from a cost efficiency standpoint, but there's a real trade-off in terms of quality service or relia reliability for this particular workload, uh, taking this path of, of not setting a request. Um, second, if you look at this middle case, uh, is a, a container with a, um, with a request set uh, where usage is actually less of, than that request. 
Um, so here, this container would be billed at the amount of their request of different resources. Um, they would uh, have some amount of like idle cost. Um, so they would have you know, not perfect cost efficiency because it would be some waste or idle. Um, but again, they would have some expectations in terms of quality of service, um, just given that, again, the, the scheduler has allocated these resources uh, for this particular pod or, or container. And then you know, lastly, uh, there's this third example where it's the same as uh, the, the second example, uh, but there's a limit applied. Um, and what we're saying here is that like limit is actually not relevant in the open cost spec. Um, the example that we talked about was, um, let's say you want to uh, borrow some money from your, uh, your parents. Um, what you actually borrow and spend um, is like usage where you would uh, you know, need to say be billed for that or repay that. Um, if you ask, if you request them that they set aside some amount of money, um, then it's only fair to say they can't spend that money elsewhere. So they should be, um, you, you should be responsible for that in some capacity. But what your limit is, you may never reach, um, is largely not relevant um, from our perspective in terms of what you actually spend or, or consume. Um, so I would just say maybe one other example to point out is that if you think about these burstable cases, there, there is a scenario where you actually have usage that is far above your request. Um, there, you, know, you would actually be billed on your usage. Um, again, that would be totally possible if there are you know, resources available in that environment. And so now that we've answered both of those equations, so like cost of your total environment, as well as like cost of individual container, um, we can now put it all together uh, and think about the cost of, of idle or efficiency. Um, so again, on the left here, we, this is the, just the breakdown in cluster costs across these you know, different dimensions we talked about from like um, allocation-based costs and usage-based costs. So you look in the middle, um, you know, that can then be split on the allocation side between idle and allocated, and then all of the allocated and usage costs are deemed workload costs. So all of the remainder would be a calculation of, of cluster idle. Um, and this is actually the number one starting point uh, when we think about applying the open costs like data to an environment to like actually do the really cool like optimize uh, really efficiently. We start by looking at this idle cost. Um, it is like truly the one number that I recommend starting with. And this can be eye-opening. Like it is very common where we start with uh, users and they're like 80% idle uh, or sometimes even 90% idle in a, in a Kubernetes environment. Um, so if you start with one number in terms of like trying to be efficient, we, we definitely recommend that. All right, cool. So let's talk about some of the lessons we've learned. Again, I would say that these are lessons that we've learned over the past like four or five months building the open costs project with the like you know, community of contributors. But these are also lessons that we've learned um, from like you know years of working with with thousands of companies, uh, you know, like optimizing their Kubernetes environment. And the first is that like real time data actually matters. Um, it may be less important from like a roll up monthly reporting or you know quarterly reporting. But it's actually really important when you think about how you can actually apply uh, the insights available from this data. Um, so again, you can now do really cool things like auto scale based on costs that largely like weren't possible before this, this data is available. Um, so that, uh, I'm excited about the open costs project. Um, already a number of integrations uh, from users that we've talked to just in the past week uh, that are in the works. So we expect like just more and more really cool like you know open source um, like uh, solutions built on top of this data. And then secondly is just having the ability to to think about uh, cost by any dimension um, is ultimately what enables again teams to actually do something with this data. Uh, as engineers, we tend to be pretty skeptical uh, when you just show us like say a single cost for a microservice or a single cost for a namespace, like our first question is often why, and then like our second and third question is also often why. Um, so just having the ability to like drill down to like, okay, show me exactly where I'm requesting these resources, right? Or show me exactly what usage is and, 
And if you can go all the way down to C Advisor and show me like the source of truth you're using, um, that can be really powerful for getting you know, teammates bought in. Um, and also just again, removing this ambiguity of like, well, hold on, you say this costs you know, $100, somebody else says it costs $150. Um, it kind of takes that off the table when you can look at this from, from different dimensions. Um, and then third is that, you know, we talked about how in, you know, VM-based uh, world uh, kind of pre-containers, um, there was this like um, cloud tagging and mapping exercise that was done. Um, it was often, you know, generally, in my view, like pretty cumbersome. Um, now this just kind of fits into the developer workflow. Again, however you're organizing applications, whether it's by namespace or something else, um, OpenCost would just pick that up by default. Um, if you did want to use, say, like labels or annotations or something within Kubernetes land, it's generally really easy to use like a policy agent or some capacity to like actually gate deployment. Um, and I would say that can be like fixed or addressed really quickly. Um, and then we talked about how um, cost efficiency uh, for at the cluster level um, is typically like the best place to start when either like thinking about this from like a FinOps point of view or just thinking about from like an engineering optimization exercise. Um, again, I mentioned how like it is not uncommon for us to see teams running at like, you know, 10 to 20% cost efficiency or 80 to 90% idle. Um, and, you know, a lot of different applications obviously you know, being run on Kubernetes, but I'm really surprised how common it is or how, how much um, teams cluster around say like 60 to 75% idle once they spend even just a little bit of time thinking about this problem. Uh, so, you know, the net impact of that for most is like a major, major like cost reduction, um, typically with like zero impact uh, to performance, reliability, et cetera. So those are some of the, the key lessons we have learned. Um, wanted to just open it up for any potential questions. I know we've got a couple of people in here that have worked on UIs and integrations on top of open cost. So welcome any hard ones too. Great question. Um, so open cost itself is the core allocation engine that KubeCost built. Um, again, it was contributed to the open cost project at the time where that like community built the open cost spec. So if you look at kind of anything from the community version up to like enterprise version of KubeCost, all of the pricing data, all of the like um, allocation is based on open cost. And so now that uh, open cost has been accepted to CNCF, uh, we're going through the process of like moving that to a totally neutral home. Um, so if you look at it today, like the open cost project still lives in the Coop costs, you know, GitHub organization. It's going to be moving to like the new open cost GitHub organization maybe as soon as this week, uh, if not in the next couple weeks. Um, if you look at like open cost IO, there are certain places where it like points back to Coupe cost stock still. We're gonna like have a totally independent open cost. So, so going through that process now of like, you know, again, totally removing it. Um, Coupe cost will, as far as I can see, like always build on top and truly like import the open cost library um, as its core. Um, and yeah, really excited to see, you know, what, what other like, you know, projects may think about doing something similar there. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool, cool. We have one online. How do you calculate the exact cost, for example, using cost support from a cloud vendor? Following, a following question is how do you reflect various pricing mechanisms such as reserved in, instances or spot instances? Cool, great questions. Um, so twofold, by default, when you deploy open cost, it would um, understand the environment you're running in. So I heard Cur, so let's just assume like it's an AWS or EKS environment. Uh, so it would by default, um, as it's spinning up, go and pull public uh, billing pricing uh, from AWS. 
Um, and so if you're running in you know, M5, XLARs, and US East, et cetera, it would reflect like public pricing. Uh, but then you have the ability to actually go and integrate it with your CUR. Um, so there you would actually reflect, say, the cost of an enterprise discount program or a savings plan ac application or reserved instance, et cetera. Um, so again, by default, kind of public billing pricing. Uh, but if you are using, again, Spot or any of these other, you have the ability to like integrate it with your actual cloud account. Sweet. All right. Any other questions on open costs? Any takers? Okay, excellent. Then I think we can all go grab lunch, if that sounds good, if you haven't had it already. Thank you all for, for joining today, and yeah, let me know um, if I can share more. And again, I would say another um, cool talk or two later this week on uh, actual applications of this data in uh, different places, and again, like starting to think about the optimization you know, part of the equation now that you have this kind of real-time visibility. Cool. Thank you all. I really appreciate it.